by later societies. Uh, so if you want to think about what does it mean for Rome to have an empire, you need maybe to look back at, say, what did it mean for Britain to be an empire, to be the inheritor in some sense of, of Rome, and how that thread sort of follows through history. If you want to know more about the way that the Romans talked about slavery, a good book is by um, Sandra Joshal and Lauren Peterson, um, whose backgrounds are as archaeologists. It's called The Material Life of Roman Slaves. And they talk about trying to make slaves appear, or rather trying as modern people to find ways to see slaves in history, to make them visible um, in situations where we know that they were present. And what this means for this class today is I'm going to tell you about names of slaves and it's going to be super obvious when I tell you about how people who were slave, enslaved or who were formerly enslaved were named that we're talking about this facet of Roman history. But I want you to remember that when we talk about the names of aristocrats, when we talk about the names of citizens, uh, we're talking about people who define themselves in contrast to slavery. So let's, let's not forget that even when we're dealing with names of other sorts of Romans, uh, to see, uh, like, to, to let ourselves maybe put on the glasses and try to see all those parts of the society. All right, deep breath here. That was a whole lot of uh, stuff um, and some heavy stuff about Roman society. Are there any questions here before we dive into the nuts and bolts of naming? Depending on Dorfin to call things out for me if no one else speaks up. Nothing in chat. All right. So let's talk about name structure then. I'm going to go sort of down the hierarchy of uh, the Roman Empire. Uh, but let's begin before we dive in with just some sources for what where you might find this stuff. One of these is the Oxford Handbook of Roman Epigraphy which is about how to use Roman inscriptions as a historical tool and has a great appendix laying out what kinds of Roman name structures you might see if you're looking at Roman material. Uh, something that I used a lot when I was preparing this class is the epigraphic database Heidelberg. It has a database that you can go into and search uh, either just generally by a keyword or by a name type uh, to find Roman inscriptions. I use that to pull a lot of the examples of names that I'm going to show you. This is the complex names class. If you find yourself wishing you had more information about the basics, and in particular, if you find yourself wishing you had just a nice list of names that you could pull elements from, I have written an article that's the quote unquote simple guide, and you can find that on the heraldry.sca.org website. And finally, there's an article by Bennett Salway called What's in a Name? that gives a really nice picture not only of the basics of Roman naming, but also of how things changed in the historical evolution um, through a good more than a millennium of the Roman life. So let's start with the Tria Nomina, the three names of Roman citizens. An example is Titus Cornelius Felix. In my examples, Roman names were often abbreviated, but in the SCA, we prefer, at least for formal purposes, to have non-abbreviated names. And so I've gone ahead and highlighted in red what would it might have been written in an inscription and then given the name in full. So this would have been T. Cornelius Felix in a lot of inscriptions. So going through this piece by piece, the Prinomen is the first piece that comes from a short list. It's typically abbreviated, especially later in the Roman Empire, it gets dropped out completely. The second piece is the Nomen Gentilicium. 
this is a family name. The family name typically, not always, but almost always ends in IUS. So if you're staring at a Roman name and you kind of don't know what's going on with it, looking for a piece that ends in IUS is one way of pulling out the family name. And then the final piece is a cognomen. This is the most personal part of the name. If you're a Roman and you're just hanging out with your buddies, the cognomen is probably what you're going to see used. But it still might be inherited. You might still have the same cognomen as your dad did. On the other hand, for women, well, women didn't get a prinomen. And maybe that doesn't seem like a huge deal because after all, they're very boring and they're typically abbreviated and maybe forgotten entirely. Uh, that means that for a woman, the name starts essentially with the family name. In particular, it's the father's name. But instead of ending in U.S. the way it would for the dad, it ends in A and usually I-A because usually uh, Roman family names have that I in them. And then a Roman woman could also have a cognomen. Again, this is the most personal part of her name, but it still could be inherited. You could Still could have a Roman woman's name that is essentially the same as her dad's name, forgetting about that boring bit at the beginning and then changing the dash US to dash A as necessary. Anyone have a quick question about the tria nomina or the women's equivalent? This is kind of our bread and butter of Roman names. So here's one question that you might have either undermined or if you're working with people and trying to help them choose a Roman name, you might see come up, which is, did women ever actually use prinomena? Like I know that I just told you that we're not always used two names, but what if there's some kind of exception to that? And the answer is yes, sometimes. We've got a couple of handfuls of examples of cases where women did use some sort of prinomen. If you are wondering where you would actually find these things, one is a book called Mika, by Mika Kajava called Roman Female Prinomena. Uh, this is a lovely book. It's fascinating. It's really hard to find. Uh, I went ahead and bought myself a copy from Germany because I knew I was going to be teaching this class. Uh, but it definitely is one of those things that's like an obscure academic pamphlet you have to dig around for. There's also an article by a couple of other Finnish people uh, about uh, female trianomena. And they give some more examples of women using prinomena. In particular, they give a bunch of examples of women in the Eastern Empire or in Greek-speaking places who are using trianomena. And they suggest that maybe they were doing that just because they were essentially Greek and didn't really understand how Roman names ought to work. But Mika Kajava does give some examples of prinomena that were used by upper-class senatorial women. So here they are. Apia, Fausta, Gaia, Gnaia, that would have been abbreviated with a CN since the C and G are kind of interchangeable. Lucia, Marcia, Paola, Postuma, Publia, got a couple <coughs> numerical names, Corda and Quinta, Salvia, Tertia, Tiberia, Titia, or Divia. And I need to give the caveat again. Yeah, this happened sometimes. Many weird things happened sometime in that more than a thousand years that we had the Romans around, but they were really, really, really rare. This is not a normal thing to do. It's a strange thing to do. Let's talk about something that is much, much, much more ordinary, which is technically called affiliation. 
and it's a way of indicating what your dad's prinomen was. So here are a couple of examples. Marcus Sulpicius, he's the child of another Marcus, and so he goes by Marci Filius, and in an inscription that might show up as just MF, and then his cognomen was Felix. Similarly, Valeria, the daughter of someone with prinomen Quintus, goes by Quinti Filia, and an inscription that's probably just Q, QF, and then her own cognomen was Tusca. So how does that work formally? After your gentilicium, that's after your family name, which is the important part of your Roman name if you're a Roman citizen, because it shows that you come from a Roman family and all of that represents, you stick in your dad's prinomen. Grammatically, it goes in the genitive, and other, that's how you say of in Roman, is you, you change the ending of the word. So you change the dash us to a dash e, uh, but honestly, it's usually abbreviated. And you add the word for son or the word for daughter, which is filius or philia, depending. Uh, but that last word, the word for son or daughter, that's again typically abbreviated. Sometimes they left it out entirely. Another thing that you can throw in in formal context, if you are a citizen who can vote, is the name of your voting tribe. There's a little bit of Roman technicality stuff about the difference between being a Roman citizen and being someone who can actually vote because you originally you had to actually be in Rome to be able to vote. You had to be able to like physically show up on voting day and do the voting. And this was slowly extended to various other people in outer parts of Italy and then slowly maybe through other people who maybe even weren't in Italy. Uh, but there was some technicality where you could be essentially a citizen, but not actually belong to a quote unquote tribe. It's a tribus because there were mythically at first three tribes, but very quickly, as far as the historical record goes, there were more voting tribes. A couple of examples. Uh, we've got a Marcus Valerius Marci. You can see in that filiation, he left out the filius because it doesn't really matter. And then Quirina is the voting tribe and Firmus. Uh, similarly, we've got Lucius Calpurnius Colina is the voting tribe. Tribu, that means from the tribe and Longus. If you're a Latin grammar geek, you might notice that tribes conventionally are feminine. So legendarily, there were only three tribes. In practice, eventually there were as many as 35 voting tribes. This typically gets abbreviated and it shows up after the father's prinomen if we're doing the full on a fancy Roman name with affiliation, but before your cognomen. So here's the list of all uh, 35 of the Roman voting tribes, according to the Handbook of Roman Epigraphy. Uh, you can pull out your favorite. Some of these sound kind of goofy looking if you're looking with a modern eye. Um, Lamonia is kind of fun. Uh, Voltinia, Voturia. And some of these are actually identical to the names of Roman families. For instance, Claudia is also a Roman nomen gentilicium. Uh, similarly, Cornelia is a nomen gentilicium as well as tribe name. Any questions here while we're pondering this cool list of names for a second? This seems like a good time to check in for questions. So just on that last thing you said, so you mentioned that the tribe names are generally in the feminine and aren't the, um, the gentilicium are in the masculine, right? If you're a man, yeah. Oh, okay, right, right, yeah. Okay, yeah. cool. Of course, only a man can belong to a voting tribe, so. Right, but yeah. where you would see, but that's why you would see a feminine name element in the middle of a masculine name. Oh, okay, cool, thank you. Mm -hmm.
So how would someone who's uh, Norman and uh, Tribe are the same, how would he write out his, his, his name? Uh, he would be, say, Marcus, Claudius, uh, Marky Fili, and then Claudia Tribu, because the Tribu is grammatically feminine. So he's like from the Claudian tribe. And then whatever his cognomen is. Um, along those lines, um, I noticed that both of the examples that you gave of people using tribe names are um, are men. Mm -hmm. um, would a tribe name be used in a woman's name? I don't believe so. Now, of course, once I've said this, someone's going to run off and like dig through all of the epigraphy in Roman history and find an exception. Um, but standardly, it wasn't part of women's names because standardly, women were not able to vote. Okay, and, and the, I have to admit the main reason I'm um, asking is because I know someone who would be super happy if she could have Lamonia in her name. Uh -huh. uh, so. <laughs> Yeah, um, so we should hunt around because it's certainly possible that there is a cognomen that's derived from the tribe name or that there's even potentially a related obscure uh, family name. Um, yeah, but that's so, a separate question that I can just message you about later. <laughs> yeah, by all means, we can do some hunting. So what name did D Julia Domna go by? To her friends, she would have gone by Domna. She so had a two-part name, or was there a longer version for it? I I don't know. She uh, she could have used the filiation, um, but the two-part name is just sort of standard basic name, and then you can throw things more in as necessary. Thanks. Sure. Uh, so. Occasionally, you do see people identifying their spouse's names um, in their own name. Uh, an example is Sulpicia Praetextata Crassi Uxor. Um, so Sulpicia Praetextata would have been her standard name. Uh, there, Sulpicia is her family name. She's a daughter of a Quintus Sulpicius. Um, Praetextata is her cognomen. And then she married someone whose cognomen was Crassus, and so she was known as Crassi Uxor. In terms of how the grammar's going, you're taking the husband's cognomen, you're sticking it in the genitive, which means that we change the U.S. to the I. We're throwing in the word for wife, which is Uxor. If you like obscure English grammar, Uxorius is the name for someone who loves their wife maybe excessively. Uh, and this happens occasionally, but it's the kind of thing that you really only see when for some reason somebody wants to emphasize who they're married to. Um, so it's not something that, that was standardly part of the name, it's just something that could be included uh, if somebody wanted to tell you how much they cared about their spouse, potentially in, um, say, a funeral inscription where they were talking about how they were grieving their spouse, something along those lines. Can I, can I ask you to touch on word order a little uh -huh. more? Um, so what are you wondering about here? Um, well, okay, so I know somebody who is somebody, ux or somebody. And that's how uh -huh. it's registered in the SCA. Would it more likely be somebody, somebody Uxor? It, this changes a little bit over time. Um, so this word for wife, um, like Latin gets used as a language of record pretty much all through SCA period. Um, and after the Romans, uh, for instance, an English speaker who was writing in Latin would be more likely to use the English word order where you put the word for wife first and then the father's name after that. Um, the Romans ordinarily um, 
put the husband's name first and then the word for wife after it. But the Romans were also pretty flexible about word order. In Latin, because you've got those grammatical endings telling you how stuff goes together, you can flip them around. And in particular, if you look at uh, less formal stuff, if you look at names of non-citizens, or if you look at later Roman inscriptions, you may see them swapping the word order up. Okay, because I saw the, the, the question first occurred to my first occurred to me when when I saw the position of Phileas and tri Tribu. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm showing you what was in some sense the most common Roman order, um, but there was some flexibility to move stuff around. Okay, thanks. Sure. All right, let's talk about adoption. Here's an example. We have the eldest son of Lucius Aemilius Paulus Macedonicus. His eldest son got adopted by a man named Quintus Fabius Maximus. This happened for two reasons. Um, one reason is that Aemilius Paulus had four kids and trying to mentor four different kids as they tried to become successful Roman uh, leaders is expensive. And so he wanted to maybe share the glory and let some other family help out with setting his sons on a, a brilliant career. Um, he also had two wives, so it's possible that that played into it somehow as well. Um, but for whatever reason, his eldest son joined another family and on joining another family became Quintus Fabius Maximus Anilianus. Uh, Another really famous adoption example is a man named Gaius Octavius. He was early, so he didn't have a standard condiment. Um, but he got adopted by, guess who, Gaius Julius Caesar, and therefore he became Gaius Julius Octavianus. So how does this work? You start with your adoptive dad's name possibly including the cognomen, because of the standard Roman thing where your name looks pretty much possibly exactly like your dad's name. But maybe you still want to reference something about your birth family. How do you do that? You take your old family name, your old nomen gentilicium, and you change the eus ending to an ianus ending. So for instance, Octavius becomes Octavianus, and we see Aemilius becoming Aemilianus. And then we stick that on as a new cognomen. It's possible that this gives you lots of cognomens and you just stick your new one on at the end. This is, in some sense, the normal Roman adoption way of doing things. If you know one thing about Roman adoptive names, this is probably the one thing that somebody has told you before about Roman adoptive names. Uh, and this is where the cool name Octavian comes from and where, for instance, the name Julian comes from or Juliana. Uh, lots of fun Roman names that we know and love are in some way taken from this way of turning nomina into cognomina. But it isn't necessarily true that every single person who has a cognomen ending in Ionis was literally adopted. They could just be related to someone who was adopted. You know, maybe your dad was adopted and you're using all of his cognomen, so you throw in that adoption looking cognomen yourself. Um, or you could want to point out in your name that you're related to lots of really important people. Say your dad's from a pretty cool family, but your mom's from an even cooler family, and you want to make sure that everyone you meet knows that you have lots of really, really, really important relatives. Well, in that case, you can take this handy method of creating a cognomen out of a nomen and throw your mom's family name into your name as well. So therefore, these names became pretty popular. You see them all over the place. For instance, 
Pictus Flavius Vespasianus. We have no reason to think he was actually adopted. He just used that name. But it gets weirder. The Romans did this thing where, as a citizen, you could leave another citizen, not just a bunch of property, but your actual name in your will. Uh, usually, the old name goes at the end and the adopted name goes at the beginning, but other possible orders also happened. So here's an example, pretty famous one. Gaius Caecilius Kilo, he inherited from his uncle Gaius Plinius Secundus, who was Pliny the Elder, and therefore he became Gaius Plinius Caecilius Secundus. So he's putting in the Gaius Plinius, that's the new name and the new prinum and nomen. And then he's adding in his old family name, Caecilius, but he's also grabbing his uncle's cognomen and using that. So here we are, we've got a Roman name. It's got two family names stuck together and I've got a cognomen at the end. Is this a situation where Will said to the person, has to has to um, take up the name in order to get the property? Yep. Yeah, it is. Okay. Um, it's a way of ensuring that your lineage lives on after death. Um, in this case, um, I don't think that Pliny the Elder had other kids of his own. And it gets more complicated. So one of the children of Sextus Curvius Sexti Filius Voltina Tullus, uh, whose cognomen was Lucanus, so this would have been a Curvius, Curvius Lucanus originally, inherited from one Gnaeus Domitius Affair. This, at this point, the, my expansions get a little weird. It was probably Gnaeus, but it's traditionally abbreviated with a CN. So what happened to that name? He became, starting out, remember, as Curius Locanus. He's now Cnaeus Domitius, Sexti Filius Votinia Tribu. So he's keeping the old voting tribe name that his original dad had. Um, and then becoming Afer Titius Marcellus Curius Lucanus. So what happened there? We got the new um, adoptive prinomen and nomen. We have the old filiation. We have the old voting tribe. Uh, we have a couple of names where we seriously don't know what they came from. Maybe it's his mom's family. And then we have his old family name and his old cognomen. So in terms of name structure, that's like a prinomen, a nomen, filiation, tribe name, a cognomen, a nomen, a cognomen, a nomen, and a cognomen, all for the same person. Are we really sure that it's all well person? Yeah, we're really sure that it's all one person. He was really big. Yeah, he was real important and he was related to a lot of real important people and he really wanted you to know that. I'd hate to have to call that guy into court. <laughs> so just to recap, we've seen prinomen and nomen. We've seen prinomen and nomen and cognomen. We've seen prinomen and nomen and two cognomena. And we've seen prinomen, two nomena, and a cognomen. And I just showed you prinomen, nomen, and cognomen, and nomen, and cognomen, and nomen, and cognomen. So you might be asking, how bad can this get? And the answer is, it can get really bad. Um, 
the fancy name for this, if you're finding yourself wanting to like hunt down more research on this phenomenon, this is called polyonomy, which is the fancy way of saying many names. And here's an example. Quintius, Roscius, Caelius, Morena, Celius, Decianus, Vibulius, Pius, Iulius, Urucles, Herculanus, Pompeius, Falco. Now the Quintus up ahead is completely uh, just miscellaneous thing that's abbreviated and he probably never ever used. Uh, he was a consul in 108 CE, just to show you that this is a regular old Roman guy doing a regular old important Roman thing, but not that weird. We're not talking about somebody off in the corners of the empire who had just like learned about Roman names on some weird tablet somewhere and kind of made up his own thing. This is a, a central Roman guy. Um, he typically went by just Q Pompeius Falco. I know if he needed a more kind of everyday version of his name to get things done with, the way he shortened it was that crinomen and then the final nomen and the final cognomen. This is a good rule of thumb. If you're looking at a long Roman name and you want to know what does this person actually call themselves, it, it's the names at the end. This can be really unintuitive for people who aren't used to Roman names. Uh, if you are a native English speaker or you're used to hanging out with people who speak English, you're used to having personal names going to the beginning. Uh, by the time we're into the Roman Empire at all, that's just not the way it works. The name that all your buddies call you is the name at the end of your name. Any other questions about polynomials? Actually, I had a question about adoption, you know, if what happened if this same guy adopted a pair of brothers, how would you tell uh, them apart? So it's possible that you couldn't tell them apart. There's plenty of versions where brothers just basically had the same name because they inherited it from their dad or their adoptive dad or what have you. Um, they might throw in a cognomen just to distinguish. It could be like a number thing or a mayor and minor kind of thing. Uh, or it's possible that they would use a different prinomen if you were being really careful. Um, so sometimes you could tell the difference, sometimes you couldn't. Depends on how much you really care. So what about um just sort of taking this to uh, the specific SCA examples, how much of this are we able to use? Like um, those, those really, really long ones, are they so rare and weird that it would be like calling yourself Henry VIII? Or, or is it, is, is this, does this happen enough that it's no weirder than, you know, um, Fred the Wanderer or other names that are uh, historically suspect but tolerable in the SCA? Um, um, so there are stats on that. Um, let me show you some stats. Excellent. Yeah. Um, so this guy named Paul Gallivan wrote an article that has a statistical analysis. There's also an article by Ali Salomiers. In fact, Ali Salomiers wrote an entire book on polyonomy, but again, it's published by an obscure uh, Italian press and it's hard to get a hold of. Um, and Solway's article has a bunch of ex specific fun examples of polyonomy. So let's look at Gallivan's stats. These are for senatorial maps. He breaks them down by century, but just if you want to look overall in the first two third centuries, um, you see a handful of people, particularly at the earlier part of that, using just prinome and nomen. You see some people who, in the records that we have, we only have their cognomen, because that's basically the name they were actually using. It's, it's the equivalent of only knowing someone's given name. So we can't tell what their more formal name structure was. You see about 60% of them using the classic Roman trionomena. You see about 10% of them using an extra cognomen. And then a full-on 16% of them are using a longer name of some sort. So if you're looking at the upper class, 
quite a few of them, especially in the second century, had these more elaborate names. It's part of how they showed you that they were really upper class. Senatorial women? Well, some of them just used their daddy's family name. Some of them, we only know the cognomen that they were going by. But even for senatorial women, it's well on almost 15% using a more complex name. Lower classes, not quite typically. Let's talk about the names of freed people. If you had been freed by a Roman citizen, you got, and if you were a man, you got to be a Roman citizen. So you'd have a prinomen, you'd have a family name, you'd have in formal context, uh, the prinomen of the person who had freed you and the word libertus, which means freed man, and you'd have a cognomen. Uh, for women, it works similarly, although women don't get prinomena, and they used uh, liberta, which is the feminine version. So working through that, again, you get a prinomen if you're a man, you get the former owner's family name, feminized if you're a woman. You get the former owner, owner's prinomen in the genitive, again, that means of, followed by the word meaning freed man or freed woman, typically abbreviated either by just the L or possibly by L-I-B. And whatever your given name used to be is now your cognomen. So for instance, the second example that I have here, this was probably originally a woman named Haline, that sounds Greek, she might have actually been Greek or it might have just been a name that was given to her on the stereotypical assumption that Greek names are good for slaves. Something kind of weird here happens, which is that you've got this formal name that has the prinomen of the person that freed you, but what if you're, you were actually freed by a woman? We see this in inscriptions, and what happens in those inscriptions is that you see a symbol with a backwards C followed by the L for abbreviating Libertas or Liberta. So that stands for Gaiae or Caiae, which is the fake prinomen for Roman women. This also shows up in the Roman ceremony. There's a fake Gaius and Gaia are always used in the standard Roman wedding ceremony. In writing, sometimes people expand it as Gaia or Caia, but sometimes they just expand it as of a woman. It was the freed person of some woman. What if you're not a citizen at all? Well, in that case, you just have an actual gosh darn given name, whatever it is, and then you can throw in your dad's name and philia or philia. So your given name, your father's name in the genitive, these can get a little bit trickier if we're looking at somebody who didn't originally have a Roman name. Uh, but you change ostii if you can. It's typically in practice in a lot of inscriptions if that gives you two eyes, we shorten them to I. And then the word for son or daughter which is typically abbreviated. And sometimes the Romans didn't actually write that down at all. And again, the discussion that we had earlier about a uh, word order definitely holds here. You might possibly have seen that Amila Lotiusi Philia. She might have been Amila Philia Lotiusi, depending on context and perhaps depending on what she thought word order ought to be and whatever her native language was. But of course, there were plenty of Roman non-citizens who went by all kinds of things who were pretty heavily Latinized or Romanized. Finally, names of slaves. So what's the deal with names of slaves? Uh, a slave would have a given name that they went by. It might be uh, the, a name they had always had. It might have been given to them when they were enslaved, depending on their history. They would have the name of their owner in the genitive. 
you change the us to the e if you can. Sometimes in practice, you see the two eyes shortening to one eye. And you see the word for slave, which is often abbreviated, sometimes left out. So this gives us a tour of pretty much every single thing uh, across Roman society in terms of core Roman names. Do folks have questions about this? I think we've only got five minutes left. I'm probably yeah, so, um, yeah, go ahead. If you, were, if you were like writing your name on a document, would you have to write your entire name every time, especially if you had a particularly long one? Or are there particular uh, elements that were important? Yeah, so you wouldn't necessarily put in the whole thing. Um, I mean, we've seen that there are examples of people where we only know their cognomena and we know that they were senatorial, so they probably had more information going. Um, mm. the, the standard minimum is probably your nomen gentilicium, or whichever one of those, if you have several that you think is your sort of core family that you belong to, and one cognomen. Oh, okay. And after that, you sort of throw in more depending on what the situation is. Cool. Other questions? Where do uh, where do cognomen come from? Cognomen come from. Where, where do where do the cognomen come from? I mean, how do you pick one? Yeah. Um. So some of these are inherited. Often they're descriptive in one way or another. Um, they could be like a mean nickname or a nice nickname or something that means like the blonde. Um. Sometimes they're one of these adoptive cognomena that reference another family name. Um, sometimes you could actually be granted a cognomen because you had done something really impressive. So for instance, you see examples of Romans who have fancy cognomena that tell you that they conquered a particular area. A Britannicus, for instance, might be someone who excelled in the conquest of Britain. DM me on Discord. I'm trying to trade for some right now. Or the gold color. Oh, that's better. All right. So yeah, lots of options. Other questions? Well, I don't know about anyone else, but I'm going to go and uh, research a really, really long and complicated Roman name. I've been thinking about it for a while, and you have just <laughs> enabled me. <laughs> Absolutely. These are going to be in the proceedings. So you'll have all kinds of things. Um, a couple of quick things about changes over time. Prinomena disappeared. Um, this is practically important if you're looking at Roman names out there in an inscription in the wild. They often leave a prinomen out. And so if you see a long name, it may actually be a nomen and a bunch of cognomena rather than your classic trianomena. And there's this other really cool thing that happened in 212, which is that everyone became a Roman citizen if they weren't a slave. And what that means is that you start seeing a ton of people being called Aurelius because they all just grabbed the emperor's family name if they didn't have a proper Roman family name of their own. And so let me end with the most hilarious example from just after that change, which is where there was a scribe who knew that everyone was Aurelius. And so he just wrote down a giant column of Aurelius for everybody's name. And then he stuck in the names after it. And some of those people were not supposed to be Aurelius. And so you get another form of uh, a bunch of Roman family names in a row, which is where we stuck in Aurelius because everyone is named Aurelius. And then we added the old family name that you had already. So there you are. Thanks for coming, everyone. Thanks for joining with me on the exploration of just how weird and long Roman names could get. Go forth and have more names.
Thank you so much. Absolutely. Thanks for coming.